Hi everyone. In this week's lecture, I want to unpack the idea of U.S. empire in a way that expands on and also complicates Foner's textbook and all the things that we've read so far. To really get a grip on U.S. empire, we need to first get a better sense of Europe's colonization of the Americas going back to the 15th century. The first thing to know is that the arrival of the Spanish at this time sparked a monumental change in world history, where diseases, plants, animals, ideas, and technologies all of a sudden had a bridge between continents that hadn't existed between uh, or since the Ice Age. The diseases that were brought over by Europeans uh, decimated the indigenous populations of the Americas, though uh, the indigenous populations quickly rebounded or at least did over the next couple of centuries. The point here is just to push back on uh, an unfortunate myth that disease left the Americas mostly empty and open for Europeans to make claims on the land. Uh, this myth is a myth that's not true. Moving on, it's also important to note that at this time of Spanish arrival, uh, the Spanish used a system of indigenous slavery to extract massive amounts of gold, silver, and other commodities from the Americas. Alongside the Atlantic slave trade and the system of black slavery, which was developed by Spain, France, and Britain, uh, this extraction of wealth from the Americas helped to jumpstart the modern capitalist system in Europe. I don't want to get too distracted by the long history of European empire in the Americas, but I do think it's important to point out that long before the United States ever emerged as an independent nation state in North America, European empire in the Americas had already changed the history of Europe. It's also important to point out that long before the United States and even the British colonies, American Indian societies already had centuries of contact with European culture and technology. As culturally complex and militarily powerful societies, these tribes were equal players in American geopolitics. That is all to say that we need to remember that there's a history to the Americas and there's a history to North America long before the United States came on the scene. With this contextual background setting up our understanding of the early United States, I want to now talk about U.S. empire. So technically, U.S. empire can be traced back to the British colonies. But for our purposes, I want to pick up the thread with westward expansion, which began shortly after the American Revolution. Westward expansion was driven by three main things, ideologies, economic and strategic interests, and technological power. The main ideological drive behind westward expansion was this idea called American exceptionalism. This idea had its roots in the Puritan colonies. When the Puritans arrived, they described their colonial adventure as a city upon a hill. This doctrine argued that their success on the continent was preordained by a covenant with God. The city upon a hill idea also argued that the colonies would shine as an example of a righteous society and be a beacon of hope to the rest of the world. After the American Revolution, Thomas Jefferson adopted this city upon a hill idea and with his enlightenment thinking and more of a secular twist, he developed the idea of an empire of liberty. This idea held that the U.S. was responsible for spreading freedom and Republican democracy across the globe. Notably, he thought that the best kind of Republican democracy was an agrarian society of farmers. In this way, Jefferson attached America's destiny to an agricultural economy. This would be an economy of homesteaders who in the imagination of uh, the founding fathers would expand US empire westward and the settlement with new land. This model of American society encouraged American settlers to push west and establish homesteads and thereby new territories and eventually new states. In the 1850s, the drive to settle the lands to the west was reframed with a renewed religious zeal. This time it was described as manifest destiny this popular ideology held that America's settlement of the entire continent was preordained by God and inevitable. These three ideologies together, uh, city upon a hill, the empire of liberty, and manifest destiny, all came to reinforce this larger idea of American exceptionalism. And the idea of American exceptionalism runs throughout US history and is actually uh, very much alive to this very day. So we should pause here and remember that Although the current U.S. borders may seem natural, stable, and coherent, the border as we know it today was created through a series of historical accidents. 
That is, we should not allow ourselves to get caught up in the myth that the United States control over the middle portion of North America was somehow inevitable. Instead, we should recognize that today's borders were shaped by active conquest and an incredible amount of violence. This leads to my next point, which is that the expansion of America's empire on the continent was driven not only by ideology, but also by economic and strategic interests and also military power. Putting ideologies about land and settlement to the side, land was also the main economic resource driving America's growing agrarian economy. The North pushed West as homesteading families, and the South pushed West with its plantation economy. The discovery of gold in California in 1848 threw westward expansion into overdrive. Not only did gold attract a new wave of European immigrants to the United States, it also drove Northerners and Southerners to occupy all the land heading toward California so that the new territories and new states would reflect their respective political and economic systems. This was a major issue leading to the Civil War. But let us not forget that indigenous people already occupied much of the North American continent, and many of these tribal nations were serious military powers in their own right. Thus, to negotiate the settlement of land, the U.S. created treaties with indigenous tribes to secure the peace. The very nature of these treaties meant that the U.S. recognized that these tribes were independent nations that needed to be dealt with according to international law. But the growing U.S. population and the growing demand for land and at the same time, uh, the growing military power of the United States Army uh, meant that the U U.S. gained a military advantage over indigenous societies. With this turn of events, the U.S. traded its treaty-making policy for a policy of all-out warfare against the Indian tribes. And these battles often developed into genocidal campaigns. For example, in the 1830s, President Andrew Jackson developed the idea of forcibly removing Indian tribes across the Mississippi River. This culminated in what is called the Trail of Tears, where 125,000 Cherokee were forcibly marched into present-day Oklahoma. Uh, along the way, 3,000 people died. Another example was the California Genocide. After gold was discovered in Alta, California, around the beginning of California statehood, the U.S. government funded militias to hunt down and destroy entire Native communities. Nearly 10,000 people died, and an estimated 20,000 were then thrown into a new system of indigenous slavery that fueled California's economy for many decades. More massacres occurred when, in the 1860s and 1870s, the U.S. Army invaded the Southwest, the Great Basin area, and the Northern Plains to fight tribes like the Comanche, the Apache, the Cheyenne, and the Lakota. In many of these encounters, the army massacred entire villages indiscriminately, though some tribes like the Lakota Sioux had the military advantage still and were able to beat back the army, as was the case in the Battle of Little Bighorn where General Custer was killed. After the last of these major Indian wars, the U.S. created the reservation system and pushed tribal groups into mostly inhospitable land where they became largely dependent on government rations. Nevertheless, some of the old treaties remained legally intact, and reservation tribes were able to hold on to legal sovereignty as recognized tribal nations. Going back to our image of the U.S. borders, as is typically shown on political maps, this image erases the fact that tribal nations still exist within the U.S. borders, and they continue to struggle with the U.S. for self-determination and sovereignty rights. Granted, in this long history, Many tribal peoples also gradually assimilated into American culture as well. Altogether, the lessons that we should take away here is that American empire on the continent was never preordained, it was never natural, and it was never complete. People can only think this way if they erase the worldview and the politics of indigenous people from world history, uh, which is what U.S. national history often has tried to do for a long time. So we need to uh, think beyond that. Related to this, we need to keep Native American representation in American history in mind. Another lesson to take away here is that American empire was created through military violence that was often genocidal in nature. One of the definitions of genocide is that it seeks to erase cultural memory from a territory, i.e. cultural genocide. And if we use this definition to understand American history, 
then all of westward expansion was itself genocidal because uh, nearly all of the territory was occupied by indigenous societies until uh, the U.S. pushed its way through. I want to transition here again to connect America's continental empire with America's global empire. We can look back at the Monroe Doctrine as an early precedent to signal America's global ambitions. Created by President James Monroe after the American Revolution, the Monroe Doctrine argued that the U.S. should be the only European power in the Western Hemisphere, and that other European powers should just stay away. Keeping Europe out was one thing, but expanding U.S. power overseas was another. This overseas empire began around the turn of the 20th century with the Spanish-American War. As an industrial power on the rise, the U.S. defeated the Spanish and annexed the Philippines, Guam, Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Dominican Republic. The new conquest inspired Teddy Roosevelt to revise the old Monroe Doctrine in what became known as the Roosevelt Corollary, which was in the textbook. Here, Roosevelt argued that U.S. interests uh, gave it the right to intervene in the politics and economies of Latin America. Uh, among other things, this philosophy justified the U.S. construction of the Panama Canal, which it did in its own interest in global trade. And uh, it also gave the U.S. corporations permission to assert control over Latin American governments. Just to keep the global perspective in mind, uh, the expansion of U.S. empire at this time coincided with the expansion of French, British, and German empires in Africa and in Asia. We can think of this as U.S. empire being a part of Western empire in general uh, at the turn of the 20th century. This view allows us to see larger patterns, uh, such as the fact that Western countries were using industrial technology to reinforce their militaries, giving them technological means to project their power around the world. It also allows us to see that all of these Western countries used the emerging concept of race to rationalize and justify uh, imperial expansion. On one hand, Western countries used racial thinking to denigrate and dehumanize the people they were occupying. And on the other hand, uh, these Western countries felt that the white race was morally responsible for civilizing the rest of the world through empire. Uh, this is a throwback to Jefferson's notion of the empire of liberty. Hence, uh, this is where American history and European or Western history is kind of interrelated. Jumping uh, into the Cold War, the Truman Doctrine gave a new spin to American empire. The U.S. began to see its influence over other countries around the world as fundamental to its own national security, and the U.S. gave itself the mission to defend the future of capitalism. This was basically a blank check that justified all kinds of interventions in other countries' affairs. Often breaching international law, the U.S. repeatedly destabilized governments and homegrown democratic movements to pursue its own interests. And to double the irony, it asserted its influence through friendship with authoritarian leaders, and it often used the CIA or direct military intervention to, uh, to achieve its own strategic goals. U.S. interventions in Iran, uh, the Vietnam War and the bombing of Cambodia, and interventions in Nicaragua are but a few of many examples. The latest transformation of U.S. empire is the War on Terrorism otherwise known as Operation Enduring Freedom, which was put forward by the Bush administration after 9-11. This was another blank check to invade any country that the U.S. deemed necessary to protect its own national security. And as most of you should be familiar with, uh, this is the context behind the invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan. With Afghanistan in the news, what you may not know is that the U.S. first got itself involved in Afghanistan during the Cold War. First of all, it's important to recognize that what we know as the country of Afghanistan is a product of European interventions going back centuries. Uh, on the ground, the region is composed of many different ethnic groups and tribal groups with different political orientations. So the line around the map is something of a construction from the European point of view. And the political reality on the ground was much different. And the people who lived there lived by kind of different rules. In the 1970s, the USSR was trying to gain influence in that region. And at the same time, independent of any Russian influence, uh, there was a homegrown Islamic socialist movement that came into power. Fearing the Russians, the U.S. saw this homegrown socialist movement as a Cold War threat, and so the U.S. intervened to topple this movement. 
which created instability in the area. Later in the 1980s, Russia tried to formally occupy the region. In response, the U.S. funded, armed, and supported uh, a group of Islamic fundamentalists called the Mujahideen, and this was meant to help push the Russians out of the region. Notably, a young Osama bin Laden was a member of the Mujahideen at the time, hence uh, Osama bin Laden was once an ally of the CIA in the fight against communism. The U.S. coup was a success, and the Mujahideen successfully pushed Russia out of Afghanistan, uh, especially using uh, you know, military technologies from the U.S., like Stinger missiles that were able to shoot down Russian helicopters. But as time went on, the next generation of Mujahideen rebranded themselves as the Taliban. Hence, the U.S. had a significant role in creating the Taliban as we know it today. And at the same time, our former ally, Osama bin Laden, changed his tune at this time uh, and started Al-Qaeda to pursue a holy war against the West. And in 2001, as we all know, he organized the terrorist attacks uh, on 9-11. So in response to the 9-11 attacks in the U.S., the U.S. invaded Afghanistan and then Iraq. Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11, uh, but was one of the world's largest oil reserves, so the Bush administration added Iraq to its Middle East strategy. Although the U.S. had told the world that it was interested in nation building in these two countries, the U.S. invasion force killed a lot of innocent civilians and destroyed these countries' basic infrastructure. The resulting chaos uh, opened up the door for sectarian violence between religious groups and tribal groups, who, who at the time were only being held together by these arbitrary national borders that had been established by the British and the French, after World War I. So this is a big tangled mess, basically. Uh, hence, anyway, when the U.S. invaded these countries, it opened up a kind of Pandora's box uh, that had been in the making for some time. In the meantime, as these societies were disintegrating under U.S. invasion, the American defense industry, private contractors, and corrupt local politicians made out like bandits, and U.S. oil corporations got a foothold in the region. Altogether, it's not like things were great in that part of the world before, but the long history of European and U.S. imperialism in the region had created the conditions in which failed states and extremist groups could flourish. There is a lot to take away when we analyze these events, uh, but I want to return to a question about American history that I have referenced a couple of times already, which is based on a structural analysis of American freedom and American democracy. We have already unpacked how within the U.S. society, uh, some people's freedom has often been connected to other people's oppression, uh, with people's experience being connected by politics and economics, for example. With this lecture, we can use our understanding of U.S. empire to see another structure outside of U.S. society that is nevertheless connected to U.S. society. This allows us to see a hidden dimension of how American freedoms are relationally connected to forms of oppression in the broader world. And this then uh, gives us a deeper understanding of how American history is connected to world history. And that allows us to ask new kinds of critical questions about things like self-determination, democracy, and human rights in a way that includes all the people of the world, not just Americans. Before leaving, I'll return to the theme that I'm not here just to say negative things about American history. The history of communism has its own problems, Islamic fundamentalism has its problems, even self-determination movements of all kinds have been known to go sideways and become authoritarian in nature. At the same time, to say that the U.S. hasn't done anything good in the world is obviously an overstatement. There are no simple answers about the relative ethics of these different political systems and cultural worldviews. Uh, what we can do with this knowledge is be awake and not be deluded by our own political myths. This is the first step to seeing the complicated world for what it is. Uh, this should be the beginning of our ethical and political thinking. And if anything, uh, we can't make American politics any better if we don't recognize the erasures and the contradictions that are inherent in our definitions of American freedom.